All right, everybody, here we go. We've got a lecture coming up, and this lecture is called The Basics of Creating Models. Oh, wait, what's this? Action, uh, the, basics of, the basics of evaluating models. And the reason I say that is because evaluation in machine learning is sort of like creation. And that is, you know, we're doing all this complicated stuff to get a computer to produce a program. Goodness knows what it produces. And so the human's role in this process to a large degree is, you know, like, number one, feed it the right data, feed it in the right way. But a very important part of that is making sure that the thing that the machine learning is spitting out on the other end is going to meet your needs, is going to be the model that you're going to want to deploy. And in that sense, the way you evaluate the models that machine learning outputs is a pivotal part of being a successful machine learning practitioner. And in fact, this is just lecture number one. Like I used to call this evaluation 101 as the lecture. I think um, there may be five, maybe six different lectures that you could call legitimately part of a series of like evaluating models at the next level of complexity, the next, the next, the next, the next. And um, you know, if you, if you don't like testing, if you don't like evaluating, if you don't like measuring, if you don't like statistics, I'm sorry, we're gonna get through it together. And by the end, I hope you'll think it was a lot of fun. Okay, let's get started. Evaluation is creation. And here we see the diagram from a previous lecture, and it shows at a super high level what machine learning is doing. And that is you give the machine learning algorithm the output that you'd like for a particular piece of data. And the machine learning algorithm churns away and processes and does all the fancy stuff we've talked about, loss, optimization, blah, blah, blah. And it outputs a model. And this model is essentially a program that in the future, if you were to feed it new data, but new data that looks similar to that original data, and um, put it into what we call a machine learning runtime, the machine learning runtime would execute that model on the new data and produce outputs. And if the model is of high quality, then you know when the new data is similar to the original data, the new output would be similar to the original output that was input. And if you, if you remember all the definitions from before, data here is the X or the feature vector features. And output here is either uh, called the Y, or sometimes it's called the F of X, right? Or sometimes it's called the labels. So that's just to get us back to like, okay, here's what we're talking about. Now you might have some questions. Your first question is, we produced a model. Does the model do a good job of mapping new data to output? That's a question. That's something that we're gonna have to evaluate. We're gonna talk um, over future slides how to go about evaluating it. Um, it can be a little bit of a tricky topic. All of these measurement things turn out to be a little bit of tricky topics. The next thing that you might end up doing is say, well, okay, you know, I have a machine learning algorithm, but there's, like we said, there's thousands of machine learning algorithms. What if I tried machine learning algorithm number two and I got model number two? Which should I use? Is model number one, the original model, better than model number two or vice versa? So there's a very precise type of evaluation question that you're going to want to ask over and over and over when you're doing machine learning. And let's say that the models are different. They behave very differently. Maybe their accuracy is very similar, but model one, whenever it makes a mistake, it tends to make a mistake by saying that Y is one instead of saying that Y is zero. Whereas model two, when it makes a mistake, it tends to make a mistake of saying Y is zero when Y is actually one. So those are very different types of mistakes. And part of evaluating models is knowing are the mistakes similar or different, which are better you know, for my application because a particular type of mistake might be very expensive while another one might be very cheap. In the um, assignments that we're doing, we're dealing with SMS spam messages. And so, you know, one type of mistake is that you take a spam message and you put it into the inbox. That's not great, that's a little bit irritating. Another type of mistake is that you take a very important message from a personal friend and put it into the spam folder. Now, those mistakes have very different costs and different algorithms may tend to make different types of mistakes. We're gonna get into all these conditions much more um, in, through the course of this lecture. Another thing that's gonna happen is, I'm, you know, like this is step number one in my PowerPoint animation, you know, extravaganza. And I'll say, I, you know, I have a friend who did like, 
some little comic cartoons in PowerPoint and animated them and he really opened my mind to what's possible. And the point of this is to say that you're gonna learn a lot of models when you do machine learning. You're gonna learn hundreds of models, thousands of models. Through the course of this course, just doing the assignments you have to do for this course, I don't know, I didn't count, you may learn a thousand models, you may learn four thousand models. And in the process of doing that, this notion of which should you use becomes a much more complicated question. And we start to get into notions like statistical bounds and saying, well, you know, like if you do a whole bunch of statistical tests, what's the chances that a few of these models look good by accident? And so part of evaluation is understanding the risk that you're putting yourself in as you're doing the process of tuning models and creating thousands of alternatives and considering them and, um, you know, trying to figure out which you're going to ship into your production system. So that's a little bit of an overview of evaluating models. Now I'm going to talk through um, how you go about doing it. And the first question you have is that we need to get data for evaluating your model. And in the previous lecture, we talked about that book data set and we'd said, okay, each row is a training data and, you know, taken together that makes up your training set. And then you're going to run a model on that to, you know, run a machine learning algorithm on that to produce the model that you want to produce. But turns out that you need to actually break your available data up into a few sets. And these sets are going to allow you, uh, 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 see, one, two, three sets. These sets are going to allow you to do what you need to do in order to create and evaluate or evaluate and create uh, an effective machine learning model. So the first set that you're going to break out of your full training or your full data set is called the training set. And this is the core data that you're going to use to learn the parameters of the model. That is, you know, if you have a decision tree, you're going to use this to learn what splits are in the decision tree. If you're doing logistic regression, like we talked about before, you're going to use this data to figure out what weights should I associate with each feature and et cetera, et cetera. This is the core data that you're using to produce the model. Then you might create a second set in which would be called the validation set. And typically the validation set is used to tune the what's called the hyperparameters of the training run. And now let me just stop for a second and do a little bit of machine learning definition. You know, fancy people, when they talk about your model and they say, well, you know, a decision tree has splits with particular thresholds, like, you know, if, if the number of pages is greater than 42. Those things that are part of the model are often called the parameters of the model. And it's maybe it's from statistics, but the point of machine learning, one way, um, one way of interpreting what you're doing in machine learning is you're trying to figure out what parameters your model should have. It's a little bit more clear in the logistic regression case where, you know, I, we're, we're going to do logistic regression in great detail in a lecture, but remember it's like you just have some weights that you multiply by feature values. And each of those weights is a parameter of the model. So there you go, parameters. Models have parameters. Figuring out the parameters, that's what the training set is for. But the modeling process also has parameters. And we'll get into some of what those are, but for example, you might have some parameters to control the complexity of the modeling process or to control how much searching you're doing or to give the modeling process some hints as to what it needs to do to produce the best possible model. And these are often called hyperparameters. They're not the parameters of the model, but they're the parameters of the modeling process. So it's very typical to reserve some of your data, call it a validation set and use that validation data to figure out what hyperparameters in your modeling process lead to producing the best model that you want to use in practice. Okay, now the final thing that you're going to want to do with data is you're going to want to reserve some of that data and call it a testing set. I'm going to get good at pointing in the right direction, like, and then I'm going to clip my, yeah, I can't point that high. Testing set. So. Once you've done the modeling process, once you've tuned your modeling process and produced the model that you really want to consider deploying into practice, you need a pristine set of data to evaluate it on so that you know um, when I deploy this model, what would I expect my customers to see and is that acceptable for my application? And so traditionally you'll reserve a set of data and not use it for anything to do with building the model. Like you would, um, almost not look at this data at all in the testing set until at the very end when you're saying, okay, now I'm gonna deploy, I wanna do a sanity check and see what's gonna happen. Is this model better than the model I was running last week? Or does it meet the um, bar that the program managers say I need to meet in terms of quality before they'll let me ship this thing? 
So those are very typical ways to look at taking the full training set that you start with that you produce through, you know, collecting data from a log source, doing feature engineering, putting it all in a data set, and that's your full data set. But then now I want to go build some models. So I'll split the full data set up into a training set, a validation set for learning hyperparameters, and a testing set for testing what we would call the final generalization accuracy of the model that you've produced. And so in the SMS spam data, we're breaking this down where this is going to be 80%. This is going to be 10%, and this is going to be 10%. But the numbers can um, vary. Why the? Oh, it's just a little bit of latency. That's not so bad. The numbers might vary depending on how much data you have in the application, and how like there we'll we'll get into a lot of things. But 80, 10, 10, that can work for now. I'll show you a couple other breakdowns as we go forward. Okay, so now we're going to go through a very common pattern for model creation slash evaluation, evaluation slash creation. And this is a simple, simple, pared down version of what you're going to end up doing through many of the assignments in the class. But this is just to kind of get you started and show you what the pieces are. Simple uh, Python pseudocode. And we'd say for each P, so for each parameter among all the hyperparameters that you want to try in this overall modeling run. And don't worry, going through the assignments, going through the lectures, we're going to get a much better sense of which hyperparameters you might want to try and what data, what statistics, what information you would look at to help you make better decisions about what hyperparameters to try. But at this point, let's just say somebody gave you some hyperparameters and you need to try them. So for, for each of the different hyperparameters, what you're going to do is build a model on the training set. And so the way you would do that roughly, I mean, this is pseudocode that doesn't quite match up with what's in the framework, but it's pretty close. You'd say you take your model object and you'd say fit. And you'd give fit the training data and the labels, the X and the Y, the features and the F of X's, all the synonyms. I'm just going to keep walking through them. And what this function here, model.fit, does is it runs the optimization process that your machine learning algorithm uses based on calculating the loss on train y and, eval and produces the model that that, you know, whatever it is, that, uh, that optimization process ends up getting you to. And the optimization process and the feature selection and all that stuff is controlled to some degree by the parameters p. Now this is this is a bit of a shorthand. It'll take a little more code than this in practice. But basically, what we're saying is for each of the hyperparameters, you fit a model so that um, you produce the model that those hyperparameters cause your training algorithm to produce. The next thing you need to do is evaluate. Okay, I produce this model. Is it any good? And so evaluate is a function that hides a little bit of stuff, which you know we're gonna we're gonna be coding these in the first few lectures. So you're gonna have your own versions of these. But evaluate essentially says, give me the correct Ys, the true Ys for the validation data set, and then run my model and have it make predictions on the validation features. So after calling model predict on validation X, you'll have an array of what's called y hats, and that is your model's predictions on the validation data. And here you'll have the array of y's, which is the true labels of the validation data. Then you call some evaluate function, and we'll get into all sorts of options for that, but you could just say that this is going to be something like accuracy. And you would store in a dictionary of accuracies with the key of, you know, for this parameter, I got these this accuracy reading. OK, so, so this code loops over the hyperparameter settings that you're trying, builds a model, evaluates the model on the validation data. Nobody's looked at the test data yet. So far, we're just looking at the training set and the validation set. Then after you've done with that loop, you can do, and this is like slightly fancy Python. This just says, give me the P that had the highest accuracies. Give me the parameter settings that had the highest accuracies from this dictionary that we built up throughout the process of doing this loop. So right here, this is, this is the, the P 
that produced the highest accuracy among all the ones that you tried. So you'd say, okay, maybe that's the one that I would want to use in the model that I would deploy to my customers because it was the best. So then you would say, well, okay, now I know what probably the best hyperparameter setting is. Now let's build a model on as much data as possible so that I have the best chance to fit the best model parameters. So you might go back and do final model fit, which is the same as at this model fit we were doing up above, but for the final model. And now you add the training and the validation data together. You add the training and the validation labels together, and you use the best hyperparameter setting that you found through the initial process. Now the output of this is that final model is probably the best model that you could produce unless you know you didn't come up with the right hyperparameters or you were using the wrong feature engineering or blah blah. I mean there's a million things, but this is the best among kind of like the universe that we're dealing with here. Now you want to say, well, if I were to deploy this and run it on data that didn't have anything to do with the training process, what accuracy would I expect to see? Now there's a little bit of statistics as to why you want to do this and we're going to have a full lecture about this. But right now we just say we call this generalization performance. That is the performance of the model on data that wasn't part of training the model. And so we want to get an estimate of that. And the way we get the estimate is to run that same evaluate function. And we're going to use the test labels. So that's the Y is from the test set. And then we'll take this final model, the best model we had, and have it predict um, for the test features. And so that would be the Y hats. And then evaluate if it's accuracy, it would figure out, well, how many times, these are parallel arrays at this point, how many times does Y equal Y hat calculate the accuracy? And there you go, you print it out. And so you can see why I say that um, building a model and evaluating the model are so deeply intertwined because there are just really an incredible number of evaluations just baked into the process of doing the simplest possible model training that you could even think of. And as you get into this more and more, and particularly as we get into more advanced model structures like um, neural networks, you could find tens of thousands of hyperparameters that you'd like to try. I mean, there's really an infinite number of them and you're gonna be spending more of your time and intuition trying to structure the hyperparameter search so that the modeling process finds a good model than probably like many of the other activities that you might think of doing as part of machine learning. Okay, let's move on. What could go wrong, right? Like, okay, not that bad. We just, you know, it's a simple loop. Let's just run that loop. We're masters at machine learning now. Nah, unfortunately, no. The first thing that can go wrong is the failure of the model to generalize. And we'll have a lecture on bias variance, overfitting and underfitting, but you know, one important problem is that if you test on the same data you train on, you're going to be too optimistic because in general, many machine learning algorithms are powerful enough to memorize the data that you give them. So if you learn the model's parameters on a set of data, then say, hey model, how accurate are you on the data that I use to train you? you know, you're going to get a very, very high accuracy because it was able to essentially memorize that part of the test. But then if you bring in some new data and ask the model, hey, how accurate are you at this new data? You might find that you're far, far less accurate. And so failing to generalize is one of the important failure modes of machine learning. And it's something that you're always going to have to be on guard with if you're using machine learning in practice. The second is that, um, you can sort of cause this problem for yourself, not by directly training the model on the data, but by looking at the data a lot, looking at the test data a lot, because you can subtly bias the way you're making decisions to end up with um, a hyperparameter setting that happens to work well in your lab, but doesn't work well when you put it out into the real world. And this is just an example of like, you know, if you run enough statistical tests, eventually you're going to find a problem. And so you want to make sure you very much limit the number of statistical tests you do on your test data, keep as much as possible on the validation data, and then reserve the test data just to pop out every so often and say, hey, am I starting to drink my own Kool-Aid? Am I starting to be using hyperparameters that only happen to work on the validation data, but don't properly generalize? 
And so that's why it's very important to keep the test data as pristine as possible and look at it as infrequent as infrequently as possible. So I've even heard of people who take this really, really far where they say that the person building the model should not have access to the test data. They should never be able to look at the test data. There should be a separate team from the model builders who evaluate the models and just give the model builders a thumbs up, thumbs down. No, nothing to see here. Don't look at the data. You can't figure out what types of mistakes you're making. None of that. You should do that all on your validation data. Leave us out of it. So that's a little draconian. It doesn't ever happen in practice, but it's just a, a way to think about, hey, you know, it is really important to not trick yourself into building a model that doesn't actually work. Yeah, and you know, let me say, nothing is worse than putting all the effort into building a machine learning model, shipping it into practice, looking at the metrics, and the metrics don't move as much as you promised everyone they would. It's a really crummy feeling. So you know, you may say, oh, this, all of this stuff here is just like, why do that? It takes forever. You know, you're only gonna hurt yourself. No, you know, it's much, much, much more embarrassing to ship something that doesn't pan out than it is to spend the extra time and be like, look, you know, my model just isn't generalizing well. I need more time to work on the model building process, or I need to go, you know, change something, get more data, look at the problem in a different way. Okay. So. Another risk is the failure to learn the best model you can. You know, I said, let's take 20% of the data out and reserve that for validation and testing. Well, that means you have less data to fit the model's parameters. And many modern machine learning algorithms, particularly the deep neural networks, the human perception level stuff, requires just an incredible amount of data. So if you're talking about having hundreds of thousands or millions of training points or tens of millions of training samples is what it might take to produce the best you know, human level equivalent capability model. And you're telling me, okay, well, I wanna take 20% of that away. You just look at that and be like, well, geez, now I gotta go get 20% more data than I thought I did. That could be very expensive. It could actually be impossible in many cases. Sometimes getting a single training sample is quite expensive. So if you're gonna be reserving too much data to test, you're giving up something. You gotta be um, just sensitive to this notion that you really do want to know how good your model is, but you really also wanna produce the best possible model. It's, it's a balancing act and machine learning is one of these over-constrained problems where there's some portion of science to it, but there's also a portion of intuition and you know just using your human intellect to hold yourself accountable, be honest with yourself, and evaluate what you need to evaluate as rigorously as you need to evaluate it. So there's, you know, there's statistical answers for, well, how should we make this decision? Like, you know, there's tools of statistical bounds and stuff like that. We're going to go through all of that. But for right now, just to give a sense, um, I'm going to talk about three cases. One is that if you have very little data, like hundreds of points, and this is more in the realm of like old school machine learning or, or you know, in statistics, you might almost say that if you're doing machine learning with hundreds of samples, you're maybe doing statistics. And um, in this case, you may want to reduce, um, reserve a lot of data for validation and testing because there is so little data. You know, you could say, well, I tested my model on 10 data points and it's 99% accurate, or 90, I mean, I guess 100% accurate. I tested on 10 data points and it's 100% accurate. Uh, I don't know. What does that mean? It's very hard to know. So you may want to reserve a lot of data for testing and validation in that case. But if you have tons of data, millions plus, you don't wanna to go too far. You don't wanna do something like 20% or 50%. You would wanna look at the statistical bounds that you're coming up with. And again, we'll go through those tools and how you can apply them yourselves. But you know, tens of thousands, 10 thousands for validating and testing, that's a lot of data, probably more than you need. So you know, something, something in the thousands to tens of thousands range is, is quite good. One complexity is often that you may have an awful lot of data, but you don't have much data from today. So you have to do a trade-off between, you know, do I want to test on all the data from today or do I want to start pulling in data from yesterday, the day before, the day before? Um, those are some of the interesting constraints that we'll talk about more later in the course. And then for the assignment um, in module one, the SMS spam classification task with thousands of samples, we're going to use 20% for validate and test. So like, I think it's 10% each, something in that ballpark. Um, so anyway, th those are just some you know, simple rules that can get you started. If you come to a new problem and you're like, well, I don't know what to do, use some heuristic like that to get going and then start to bring in the more rigorous tools as you need them. Okay, so that was the first pattern for how to do evaluation creation. 
and a little bit of the types of problems and the complexities that we're going to start to get into in some of the later evaluation lectures. Now let's start talking about the second thing, which is types of mistakes. And to do this, um, one useful tool to think about, especially in binary classification, when your y can take two values, it can either be a 0 or a 1. Um, you have this thing called a confusion matrix. And um, here is the actual, which would be the y. And here is the prediction, which would be the y hat. And so if a particular training sample has an actual y value of 1, and your model predicts a 1, then we would say that for that sample, your model has created a true positive. That is a, that is a good case. That is, it was a positive sample, and you predicted positive, so you gave it a true positive. If the y actual is a 1, but your model predicted 0, then we would call that a false negative because the actual sample was positive, but you falsely called it negative. That's what your model has done. So I'll just I'll continue to walk through these. I mean, maybe you've all seen these before, but um, and I, I, I would say like maybe you've all seen these before, but these are actually important. And every so often I'm going to be like, memorize these, memorize this, right? This is just you just need to know this stuff. You need to talk in terms of these easily. If you don't, you're going to get tripped up when you're in rooms talking with machine learning people. If the actual, uh oh, what happened here? OK, it's back. Just a short clip back to where my pen kind of wigged. So if the actual is a 0, that is, the true label is 0, and your model predicts a 1, then that's called a false positive, because the sample was negative, but you falsely called it positive. So it's a false positive. And then the final case is, if everything's 0, then you've got a true negative. The sample was negative. The y was 0. You predicted 0. That's a true negative. That's beautiful. So you know, and. If you look at this in terms of particular applications in SMS spam, a true positive is a spam message that was positive. The spam was one, and the model detected it as a positive, and you put it in the junk folder. A false negative is a spam that the model said was not spam, and you put into the inbox. A false positive was a legitimate message that the model thought was spam, and so you put a legitimate message in the junk folder. And a true negative was a legitimate message that the model thought was legitimate, and you put it in the inbox. And I guess that's a little confusing because legitimate is negative, spam is positive in, you know, in the traditional setup for this stuff. OK, anyway, let's go through a few more examples of this concept. And so to do that, we'll take this little sample table of actuals, which are y's, and predictions, which are y hats. And we will fill out this matrix. So where's my Jeopardy music button? I don't do, 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 do. OK, fill out the fill, fill. So actual one predicted one. So here are the actual ones. Three times it predicted one. Actual one predicted 0. Uh, that's two times. Actual 0 predicted 1, that's 3 times. Actual 0 predicted 2, that's 2 times. So there are 3 true positives, 3 false positives, 2 false negatives, and 2 true negatives. OK, moving on. There you go. I got it right. I hope you got it right, too. If you didn't get it right, you keep, try keep trying. You'll get it. I, I have faith. You'll get it. You will definitely get it. So looking at these four statistics, um, these often get converted into slightly higher level concepts. And um, now I'm going to introduce vocabulary. And this is vocabulary that, again, memorize it. It'll be on the tests. Just memorize it. Build some intuition about these things. Take some time. Um, think about what they might mean in the context of various applications. Here we go. Accuracy, which is, I would say, I mean, certainly the most common thing, if you were to ask somebody, well, how good is a model? You'd say, well, its accuracy is 90%. And accuracy is the number of things it got right, which is that plus that, or true positives plus false negatives, true positives, true negatives. I said false. I meant true. True positives, true negatives, all the trues, the trues, the trues, the trues, divided by everything. So in this case, it's 5 divided by 10, or 50% accuracy. The next thing you might talk about 
is precision. And that is when the model says one, how often is it right? And so that would be when the model says one. So prediction of one. You're going to be looking at that column and you're going to say the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false positives. So in this case, again, we're at 50% precision. And now accuracy and precision in my example happen to be the same thing, but in general, that's not going to be the case. These are very different concepts and they mean really incredibly different things. Accuracy is of every possible thing in the universe. How many does the model get right? And precision is of every y equals one. How many does it get right? Those can be quite importantly different. Um, another property that's important to talk about is the recall. And that is what fractions of the ones does your model get correct? And so you would say the actuals, there are, here we go, five ones. And which fraction of those does it actually say one for? So that would be, you know, this divided by that. So the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives. And so in this case, it is 60% recall. There's a little bit of a kind of duality between precision and recall. And they're often used together to explain both types of mistakes that a model's making. You would often say, hey, at a particular level of precision, like at 90% precision, my model is able to get 50% recall. And that would be kind of a way that you would use two statistics at the same time to express to somebody what your model is able to do in practice. So precision and recall go well together. Remember what they are. It's going to be on the test. La di da. All right. There's another way to look at um, overall model performance, and that's false positives and false negative rates. So now we'll go through those and this is going to be, let's see if I can, let's see how well this lines up when that actually pops up there in, at some point in the future. But we're talking about um, the false positive rate is what fraction of zeros are erroneously called one by the model. So actual zero um, called erroneously called one. So you would say the number of false positives divided by the number of false positives plus the number of true negatives and that's the false positive rate. What fraction of the zeros are erroneously called one? And then the final one that we're gonna talk about here is, oh, I wasn't even close. That was terrible. Oh, go back and start this recording again. Okay, the false negative rate. And the false negative rate is what fraction of the ones are erroneously called zero? So that's kind of like, what fraction of the ones are erroneous? So the false negatives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives. And I, I stopped calculating them because the math was just too hard. It was killing my brain, but you get that sense. So here are um, a set of basic tools that are very commonly used in practice to talk about how good is the model and what sorts of trade-offs is it able to achieve between the various types of errors that are possible. And this is, this is all in like binary classification. And okay, so this is just, you know, a useful set of things that are commonly used by practice. They're sort of generally used by all sorts of different subfields of machine learning practitioners. You may hear of other ways of describing similar concepts um, used that, that are commonly used in specific, you know, like information retrieval has their words and I'm sure other, other whatever, but learn these, they're gonna get you a long way. Moving on. So what the heck, why do you need all of this stuff? And the answer is that you can have very high accuracies on a model that are actually totally unusable. And here's a, I mean, here's a little example of that. Your accuracy is 91% because, you know, the nine and the one. So that divided by this 91%, very, very good. Um, so you're going to be saying, well, for the SMS spam, you know, I'm going to get 91% of my my decision's correct, 91%. So that's like almost as good as human level because sometimes humans make mistakes, 91%. So let's ship this thing. And then somebody says, well, how many false negatives is it making? And you're like, none. 
It's taking all the spam, 100% of the spam and putting it in the junk folder. That's awesome, right? Like, why wouldn't we ship this? And then you gotta be thinking, well, 91% accuracy, it's deleting all the spam, what's it doing with the good mail? And that's when you come in, you find this problem of, well, the false positive rate, ooh, that's the one we're still working on. Actually, you know, false positive 90%, but we are almost got it, you're right, 90, you know, it's such a small number of samples. We just, we just didn't have access to too much good mail for users. So our, our model's struggling with that a little, but I'm sure we'll be able to figure it out. Okay, so there's an example of a thought process that you'd need to go to when you're evaluating this model to say, is this something I can use and do I need to keep doing work? And often these sorts of problems of, um, you know, accuracy looks good, but false negatives or false positives are a problem occur when there's a very skewed distribution of the labels. If the labels were totally balanced, you wouldn't need to worry about this stuff as much, but the labels are never totally balanced. So it's always better to think in terms of precision recall or false negative, false positive, instead of thinking in terms of raw accuracy. All right, in summary, evaluation in machine learning is creation. And this is because you have this crazy algorithm that's taking in data and the output that you want for the data, and it's trying to spit out a program. It's a little bit mysterious. And so the act of a professional machine learner is to get on that machine learning algorithm's back and watch it very carefully and be hyper certain of what it's doing. And in order to do that, you have to get all of these tools and tricks for evaluation. The first tool is this simple pattern for taking your training data and splitting it up into training data, which is used to set the parameters of the model, validation data, which is commonly used to set the hyper parameters of your modeling run, and test data, which is commonly used to estimate the generalization performance of the model. And there are many types of mistakes. A model can make false positives, false negatives. It could have high precision, low recall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very, very common in practice to talk about model quality in terms of some combination of either false positive, false negative, precision or recall, something along those lines. So they're terms that you should get very, very familiar with. All right, well, that is lecture one on evaluation. Looking forward to many more.